the book of John, chapter 15, verses 22 through 27, chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. I'll be reading in the NASB, and for your viewing pleasure, it will be in the ESV. Verse 26. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, namely, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify about me. And you are testifying as well, because you have been with me from the beginning. But these things I have spoken to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. However, I did not say these things to you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, grief has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I am leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. Regarding sin, because they do not believe in me. And regarding righteousness, because I, do, I, I am going to the Father, and you no longer are going to see me. And regarding judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them at the present time. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from mine and will disclose it to you. And all things that the Father has are mine. This is why I said that he takes from mine and I will disclose it to you. Our second reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost has come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves, and a tongue rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak. Now there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this, second, when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and and the parts of Libya uh, uh, around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were jeering and saying, they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the other eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, know this and pay attention to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you assume, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, 
and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will have dreams. And even on my male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And I will display wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our last reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 27. It reads, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, though perseverance, through perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Now in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. These are the words of our Lord. You may be seated. Uh, So you can see that I went out of order on our outline and in our scripture readings, we did it chronologically with John first, then Acts, then Romans. That's how it was written, but also chronologically Jesus, then the account in Acts, and then Romans. Uh, So that's how we're going to go through it today. We've been off for a couple weeks and uh, 10 points to whoever can tell me besides Deanna, maybe. Uh, we are just the Dean is disqualified and can answer last, uh, just like at RCF. What are these cloths called? Who said it? Had something in your mouth. Melody, 10 points to you. You can redeem those next week for if you can keep them. Yeah, the pyramids. The pyramids are red. Uh, yeah, for the day of Pentecost. So we're out of Christmas tide on Sunday. And what did I say, Christmas? <laughs> we're still out of Christmas tide. Uh, we're out of Easter tide and we're beginning Pentecost. And so Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, just to clarify, because I don't want to be the only weirdo here, uh, Noel might be the only, we might be weirdos together. Uh, it's a tradition of ours to wear garb, international garb. Right? So we're all wearing international garb, clothing, paraphernalia. Uh, Mercy, if you don't have any international clothing, you've got like three days to find some. You've got plenty of, uh, plenty of Indians uh, that could probably help you. So, uh, so we're going to start with our gospel reading in, in John 15 and... Um, really, we could spend all time there. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm gonna try to get through all of this. It's been a few weeks, so I'm a little rusty. But I just want to make the point that we all tend to minimize, and that's a part of our flesh, and that's um, in God's providence uh, to help us. I think yearn for the Spirit and His manifestations more. We all have a tendency to minimize the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and so. Uh, we may not, uh, when we, everyone's been through the baptism in the Holy Spirit study where we talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is different from the activities of the Holy Spirit. And so when I mean the ministry, uh, very directly, Jesus says that 
the advocate is going to come and he's going to testify on behalf of Christ. And we are to also testify on behalf of Christ. And so um, right there, uh, we don't have to jump. We could go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and say that you'll be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, and wait for power from my We could use all those, but Jesus says it here, that I'm leaving, and you're going to be my witnesses. What is Easter tied about? Witness. Witnessing. It's all about uh, testifying to Jesus' resurrection. That should be, that was a time uh, in uh, the last couple uh, chapters of, of the Gospels and the first couple chapters of Acts, when Jesus is, is resurrected, people are beginning to be witnesses of Christ, to testify about him, namely his resurrection, um, and that he was the Christ. He was the Son and is the Son of the living God. He did ascend to the Father. Uh, now he did pour out his Spirit. And the main mission of the church there going forward is, is, is a testimony. Um, and that happens in many ways. But uh, we all want to minimize the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we do that in very practical ways where um, I get like busy and things. So I, then I read my Bible really quickly. And then uh, at the end of my Bible reading, I'm like, oh yeah, and Lord, please help whatever I read to be effective and help me to understand your truth. Uh, and uh, that's a way that I'm thinking more humanistically and works-based than I am of saying, I don't uh, pick up this wonderful Bible I stole from a church many years ago and say, Lord, this is your words, they're true. I should sit in awe and be gentle and be still, and I need your Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to me, or else I'm going to be wasting my time, I'm going to be wasting your time, and then I'm wasting my entire life. Right? We don't uh, normally do that. We tend to minimize it. We throw scripture reading in or whatever or study. And then we then think of coming to the Lord at some point or sometimes when we read and say, oh, Lord, uh, I'm just going to need some help here or something. And so really we should fall on our faces, worship God, and beg him for help every time we come to the scriptures. And that's just in that we need the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures. Uh, we minimize the ministry, uh, we minimize all of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, right? We, um, there really is, so I follow little, little mini debates and they're all mostly worthless, the debates are, and, but it's fun and you gotta do something <laughs> with your time. <laughs> and so there's uh, currently some debates I follow where uh, it's theonomist versus pretty much antinomians and the antinomians are arguing that natural law, us being made in the image of God collectively as humans, can govern society justly versus theonomy saying we need the word of God to govern and that needs to be involved in politics and we can't rely on people, we have to rely on the scriptures. And that's a worthless debate. Uh, that's usually not how people are won over. And, um, but it's, it's fun to watch people argue. And anyways, but um, we, we tend to minimize the ministry of the Holy Spirit in like even just like our own wisdom and making judgments. And if you guys are anything like me, I tend to uh, think of like, I know I can work out the solution. I can use my own scriptural knowledge to make good decisions. And if that fails, then I'll go to like a community of others. And if that fails, well, maybe, well, then I think, well, maybe they're praying and maybe they're seeking the Lord and the Holy Spirit will give insight. And then eventually like three or four steps down the road, I'll like seek the Lord, uh, speak in tongues, wait on the Lord and pray in faith that the Holy Spirit will give me wisdom. <laughs> but that's like, that should be the first thing, right? Um, so we all minimize the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to, Pentecost, this is why we have a liturgical calendar. Pentecost reminds us that everything that the Lord is doing on earth is by his Holy Spirit. There is nothing on earth that the Father and the Son are doing that isn't given to the Holy Spirit as a ministry. Everything, 
right? And so um, the Holy Spirit uh, advocates on behalf of Christ and the Father, and we're supposed to testify also. And so when we get to our Romans passage, uh, we're going to see that the Romans, Paul is talking about a completely new birth of the entire earth. Uh, it's a new Garden of Eden. It's a new garden. It's a new birth. It's a recreation on a cosmic scale that the, the earth is groaning for the, the sons of God to be revealed. And so um, we don't always think on that grandiose of, uh, of scales, right? We think, well, the Lord's going to help me to not say the Lord's name in vain or not say heck or something or... <laughs> Uh, or whatever people say, and uh, but we don't think of like the Lord's going to use me as a as I testify about Christ, as uh, I testify about His resurrection and His resurrection power, and He's going to renew my life. I'm going to live in the power of the resurrection, and that's going to uh, affect the face of the earth until the end of time. And so. Um, We'll get to the Romans passage, but I just want to quickly hit on verses uh, 9, 10, and 11, where Jesus says, um, let's go there and let me, in, verse, in chapter 16. Uh, starting in verse 8, now when he comes, that's the advocate, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they did not believe, they do not believe in me. And so in John 14, Jesus very clearly says, believe in the Father, believe also in me. Whoever, this is in John 14, but whoever believes in me has eternal life. And so um, very directly, he's talking about the Jews and the world that Jesus came to minister to. And so not just to the, but Jesus knew the plan in history. And so uh, Jesus, again, is reminding us, reminding the disciples in the last the uh, Last Supper discourse here of that everything comes down to it's not this works based everything else comes through belief in him that he is the Christ he is the savior he's the one in Genesis that was prophesied that's going to crush the head of the serpent it's through him that everything is coming and it's through belief it's through n recognizing repenting and acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ and he even goes further to say, concerning righteousness, uh, because I am going to the Father. Doesn't that seem like a little confusing? Uh, maybe the way we think about it. I'm always like, wait, what does that mean? Like concerning righteousness, because I go, don't you mean like concerning righteousness, because like I'm the perfect human and I was pure and unstained from sin and undefiled. And uh, what do you mean by because I'm going to the Father? Right? Uh, well, just, remi just a reminder um, that we don't think biblically, uh, and sometimes things are difficult, but uh, I just put Genesis 5, 2, 21 through 24 as Enoch as an example. Uh, when you go through all the genealogies, Enoch, uh, there's like a list of, what, 20-some people or whatever, and it just says, here's the facts, here they are, they had other sons and daughters, they lived this long, and this happened. And it's very direct. Enoch was the only one that says, uh, and Enoch walked with the Lord, and he was not. And he was no more. Uh, he ascended to the Father. He ascended to the Lord. And so it's Enoch who walked with the Lord, who was taken, who went back, who ascended, uh, who the Lord took. And so... Um, it's because he walked with the Lord. And so the, the father is not receiving anybody into his company who is defiled by sin, right? And so when Jesus says that, that would be uh, very clear to a Jewish mindset to remind them that the Lord's not going to receive a sinful person. Uh, Ezekiel, right, was the, or I'm sorry, Elijah was the other one who... Uh, ascended to the Father, the chariots brought him. And, um, and so the Lord's not receiving people who aren't righteous, right? And uh, if you look at those examples of people who ascended to the Father, who went to the Father, uh, that gives you a little bit clearer picture 
of what Jesus is saying. And then verse 11, uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And so uh, very qu- quickly, I'll read John 12, 31. In case you think uh, the judgment of Satan is coming, that certainly is the case in some sense, but... Should I get, oh, 12, I was reading 13, 12, 31. Uh, now, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And so uh, when he's sending the advocate, when he's sending the Holy Spirit, it's to judge the world, uh, judge the ruler of this world, and to cast him out. That's one of the ministries, that's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit testifies about the Christ. That uh, as Jesus is the ultimate uh, head-stomping serpent killer, we will be head-stomping serpent killers, right? Uh, the other example when Jesus is making the same point is when in Luke, when the disciples come back and said, we were casting out demons and all these things. And Jesus' response was, I saw Satan uh, fall from heaven like lightning, <laughs> right? This is what I saw when you were casting out demons. Jesus, the the king of this world, the prince of this world, Satan, is falling. He's, it's coming to an end, right? And then lastly on that point, uh, Revelation 12, 7, just in case you don't believe me, um, 7 through 12, to get the whole effect. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is the salvation, uh, now is the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their, uh, love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Satan knows he's been defeated. He knows his... So right now, if you were to think and see in, uh, in the heavenlies, in the spiritual, you would see tons of angels fighting tons of uh, uh, fallen angels, and you'd see evil spirits and things going on. And uh, Satan in his dominion and kingdom would be running around like looking for something uh, to grab onto, just trying to get in like one last kick because they know that their time is short. Um, That's what Romans talks about a little bit or leads into of that the whole creation has been groaning in eager expectation. Uh, If you were just to follow historically how Christianity since the first century has shaped the world, that would be the predominant course uh, that we follow in human history. That's what history books follow uh, for the most part. And so um, Satan is on the back end. He is running away. His time is short, and he knows he's coming defeated. Uh, And that comes through our testimony uh, in renewing the earth by living renewed lives, by building Christ's kingdom. Right? And then uh, lastly on the John passage that Jesus is continuing to to teach us through the spirit of truth, right? His ongoing, uh, part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is Jesus's ongoing ministry of of teaching, revealing, and being the word of God. And so when we get to the book of Acts, um, if you were to like, sometimes I like almost wish I could erase so many things in my mind what I've already learned and just go back 
and reread scripture without the things I've learned. Um, I did that. I think I was able to do that successfully for the first couple of years as a Christian, but it becomes even harder, I think. And so if you were to just to read from Genesis and go on historically and through the prophets and come to the uh, uh, ministry of Jesus and then get to the book of Acts, you'd be like, oh my God, this is like everything everyone's ever hoped for. Like, this is crazy. Like, it's really happening. <laughs> like, no way. This is the coolest story. Right? Because there's, there's two covenants in scripture. There's the old covenant and then there's the new covenant. There's tons of smaller covenants in there. But generally, Scripture talks about an old covenant and a new covenant. And you can look to Jeremiah 31. You can look to uh, Joel 4. And so um, Pentecost was just the beginning. This is the example of like what it's supposed to be like for everyday Christians, for what we're supposed to, how we're supposed to live, how the Holy Spirit is supposed to ministry, how we're, uh, how we're going to take over the world. What are we going to do? How do we continue to testify about Christ? Well, start with the book of Acts, right? And so Pentecost was just the beginning. That was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I was going to briefly discuss the blood moon and stuff, but we'll do that later. Uh, Just know that Peter said that this is Joel, this is happening, these are the last days. But we can talk about an eschatological things later. Um, and so when we get to Romans, let's turn there. And the first verse in our scripture he says that the earth has been waiting in eager expectation, has been groaning. Um, the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And so Paul's saying that all of human history, the whole earth, has been in waiting in eager expectation until now. And that new birth, that new creation, that's terminology of like a recreation, right? The whole earth is being born again, right? Don't think born again in our evangelical way. I mean, like this, the, even the creation all the cosmos, all the stars, everybody's been waiting for this time, right? And the creation is still waiting for this time. As we press forward in the kingdom of God and we go out, you know, making disciples one by one, changing human hearts, we're not just changing um, people's lives for, so that they'd be a little happier. We're actually changing the chemistry of the cosmos, I think that's actually happening in like a, a physical and metaphysical way. And partially because um, if you look at the curses in Deuteronomy 28 and I think it's Leviticus 26, there are certain geographical things and uh, uh, that happen like drought, pestilence, things like that, that, are, that happen because of the curse, Right. And as we live according to the law of God, those things actually should happen less. And so um, this is the same type of language, the new heavens and the new earth that's we're talking about in Revelation 21 and 22. That the new heavens, there's a new heaven coming down from heaven, and that's a new heavens and a new earth where uh, Christ is sitting amongst his people as king, and there's no day and there's no night. That's what Christ's kingdom is like. That's what the uh, creation is waiting for, what had been waiting for. And so um, Paul talks about it here, and I was using kind of praying about Scripture as an example, um, just that we don't rely and minimize the ministry of the the Spirit. Uh, We do it all the time. In verse 26, Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Uh, And 27, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so, um, 
If you haven't listened to uh, Greg's prayer series or most recently to Josiah's prayer series, we all tend to minimize prayer. That means that's the same thing as minimizing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Same thing. Um, We all think we can do it. We all think we can do it apart from God. And um, I'm constantly reminded, at least every Sunday, that I minimize speaking in tongues and relying on the Holy Spirit to intercede and fill in what I can't. And the thought behind that is, because I know I think I'm smart and I know what I can pray and I know what the will of God is. That's pretty arrogant and proud and just wrong. <laughs> but at least every Sunday I'm reminded that I should probably speak in tongues more and, and, and pray and, um, and not minimize the ministry of the Spirit. And so one thing that we, to pull out of the, the prayer series is uh, not only does nothing happen on earth except by the Holy Spirit, uh, nothing happens by the will of God except through prayer. God doesn't need our prayers. He doesn't need us to pray, but he desires us to pray and causes us to pray those things according to his will, and then he acts. Uh, even when you look at... Um, uh, various texts, uh, especially in the Old Testament, of where the Lord's coming down, and it seems like uh, He's just not doing it. Like all of Israel is in debauchery. There's usually a prophet or someone praying for the Lord's will, and so uh, that is a vital ministry, uh, as Josiah put, that we have to kind of recapture and. One way to begin doing that is to not minimize speaking in tongues and allowing the Spirit to intercede for us. And of course, uh, that leads us into worship as we worship tonight. Um, uh, you know, we should practice uh, relying on the Spirit, Him, uh, you know, interceding through us, speaking in tongues, uh, prophecy, right? We just read Joel and Acts that says, uh, even your sons and your daughters, your female servants, they will all prophesy. You guys can all prophesy one by one. Just form a line. And, and if you're at the front, it's your turn. Uh, and so um, that is a testimony. Like how we live, not just when Jesus says that the advocate will, be my, will testify on my behalf and you will also testify on my behalf. That's not just meaning our evangelism. We got to kind of get that out of our heads. How we live, and like when you look at the book of Acts and on the day of Pentecost and what was happening, um, Peter explains it and he uses his words, but their actions were already a testimony to the power of God. And that's how we have to live as a community. That's why we need the Spirit. We minimize the ministry of the Spirit that we tend to say that we don't need the ongoing power and ministry of the Holy Spirit to help us live in community and in right relations and be witnesses to one another and outside the community, other Christians and non-Christians, because we live probably better than 25% of the world anyways, which isn't a big percentage, but, uh, but we're starting somewhere. And so we need to be a community that's filled with the Spirit that lives the day of Pentecost every day, that operates more like the book of Acts uh, than like the book of 1 Corinthians. (laughs) Until you get to chapters uh, 12, 13, 14. Uh, And so uh, with that, let's submit ourselves to God, worship, and call on his name to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, Father, we just glorify you here. We pray that... Uh, Our worship would be pleasing to you, Lord. We just want to please you, Lord, and we need your Holy Spirit to worship in such a way that is pleasing to you. Come and help us, Lord. We rely on you and you and your spirit alone. Through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.